we have one of my favorite speakers here, Casey Selden, to tell you about Stolen to Steal, the life story of Eno Mosho. Eno Mosho, everybody. Round of applause for Casey. Hi, everybody. Um, so I took some advice from Arthur this time around, and we're going to start right in the middle of the action with a kidnapping. December 1900, we've got a child named Manuel Cordova Rios. He's hanging out near his house in the wilderness, and he's working as a rubber plantation uh, kind of employee. It's his turn to clean and cook, and so he's by himself. And all of a sudden, 15 natives from the jungle surround him, steal him from his workplace, and he's not seen again for seven years. So what is this kid doing in the jungle in Peru in the first place? Because his father is Spanish, his mother is native of Peru, and his, um, his whole world is surrounded by the subject of rubber. Because in 1844, this guy right here, whose name is Charles Goodyear, comes up with the idea that you can combine sulfur with latex, which is what you get from rubber trees, and get a really valuable product, a commodity that is going to make him hell of rich and is going to make some other dudes hell of rich too and is going to change the Peruvian Amazon forever. Because you've got towns like Iquitos, which before this happens are um, tiny little towns of about 1,500. And then over the course of 10 years, they explode to 20,000. So it's basically kind of like San Francisco. You've got an instant population and that's only counting the urban folks, but what about these guys, right? I know, this is where it gets exciting. So the native population, they've got a very different story because you need a lot of people to go out in the jungle to get this latex from the rubber trees to make this valuable good. So they're basically rounded up and sent into the jungle to do this work. And um, they're enslaved, essentially, or at least they're brutalized and paid very little. And so in some cases, their population is reduced by 90%. So if you listen to these guys, I couldn't help it. I'm sorry. I was hoping you'd do that. Thank you. If you listen to these guys, who gives a shit? Because these are people who are cannibals. They shrink heads. They don't listen to God. They are heathens, and this is progress. We got to have tires, and so this is a small price to pay. I don't give a shit about this point of view. I'm much more interested in having a more well-rounded story, and fortunately, we've got access to that, because the kid who got kidnapped, uh, Manuel Cordova Rios, wrote in part this book about his experience. So what do you say we um, get into that story, yeah? Okay, so the day in question, he is not on site at a workplace. His father is inside his house because his mother is giving birth to his sister, and so he's playing midwife. And Manuel has been sent out with a woman of the household to hang out nearby and not cause any mischief. When all of a sudden his, bro his father shows up, um, he's wearing a different outfit than he saw before. He's actually not wearing any outfit at all, just a string around his waist that's holding up his penis, and his chest is painted red, uh, but he's got his father's face and his father's voice, and his father says, come with me into the jungle. So Manuel says, okay, and then runs for several days and ends up in a village in the jungle with the Amawaka people. He's stripped of the rest of his clothes, given a new outfit, given a potion that makes him feel really awesome and chill, and the last of his fears are erased. And then after a week in this village, he is introduced to the chief, whose name is Kishimu. And he says, according to the book that I read, on that day, I stopped being who I was, the son of my father and mother, and I began to be an Amawaka, a son of Shimu, heir to Shimu. So who's this Shimu guy? Well, he's just the architect behind this entire plot. So should we hear the story from his point of view? <laughs> Good. I was hoping you'd say that too. So um, Chief Shimu is responsible for this whole population of people who live in the jungle in Peru. And just like we heard before, they are being slaughtered, murdered, decimated by the Viracocha, which is what Shimu calls the white people. And he's um, really feeling like 
it's on his shoulders to come up with a solution to this problem of basically his whole tribe, his way of life, his his land being overtaken by the Viracocha. And it's especially challenging because it's not a fair fight. Like he's got hunters who spend their entire lives Hunger Games style or Game of Thrones style learning how to fight and to survive, but they're they're equipped with bow and arrow and spears and blow guns. And these white guys, they have all these advanced weapons and the native population, even if they have money to spend, aren't allowed to buy these advanced weapons. They're, that's the law. So they are basically signed up for slaughter. And so Chief Shimu does the wisest thing that he can come up with. He heads out into the jungle and does a bunch of drugs and meditates. But these aren't just any drugs. He takes ayahuasca, which, how many of you are familiar with ayahuasca? Okay, good. So um, the idea of his people is that ayahuasca isn't just a way to get high. It's a way to dial into the wisdom, wisdom of the jungle, to have visions that are sent to you by the goddess of death. And basically... Um, he asks these spirits for advice and is given a, a plot, basically a long con that's gonna save his people. The, the long con is based on this logic. The Viracocha are trouble, but they've got these hot shit weapons. And Chief Shimu and his people need to get their hands on these hot shit weapons, and so basically they need to get their hands on a white guy who can buy them. So just like Professor X from the X-Men, <laughs> He like takes his consciousness and expands it to the surrounding area to look for just the right white guy. But um, he's thinking that this white guy shouldn't be too old because he wants to have somebody whose mind is pretty malleable, so teenager ideally. He also wants somebody who's not too white because he wants them to have some sort of um, possibility of empathy for the plight of the native people. And he wants somebody who's not too far away because he needs to bring them into the fold. So he creates this opportunity. He finds Manuel Corova Rios, 13 years old, hanging out in the outskirts of the jungle and sends a trusted party of hunters to go and seek him out on just the right day with just the right face and just the right opportunity to convince him to come with them. He doesn't think of this as um, a kidnapping, really. He thinks of it more as a, a rescue because these white guys, they're evil, and Manuel Cordova Rios is signed up for a life of, um, of evilness as an... Uh, as a result, so he wants to rescue this child so that he can thus rescue the tribe. So Chishimu very literally takes him under his wing. He treats him like his own son, teaching him the secrets of the jungle, and everything that he knows is based on generations of wisdom that has been passed down to him, not only about life in the jungle, but also about the the, the things that the jungle can provide, including a real wealth of knowledge about the health benefits of many of these plants. So according to Manuel Corova Rios, he it goes um, alone with the chief into the jungle to take ayahuasca to be taught things about the wisdom of the jungle and the different plants and animals that live there over 500 times. There is a, a, a great deal that the chief teaches him, and he basically tells him that Manuel Cordova Rios is going to lead the tribe, but he can't do that as Manuel, so he's also given a new name, a jungle name, in an ayahuasca ceremony that all the other um, hunters of the tribe take part in, and he's named Inomosho, which means the Black Panther. At 15, Inomosho has to take over the tribe because Chief Shibu does pass away and the rest of the tribe is very much behind this idea that he's ready to lead them with these ayahuasca ceremonies and the wealth of knowledge that's been passed on to him. And of course, with this plan that they put into effect when he's 17 and he's got the man body that they need. It's a thing. Okay, so... They go into the jungle, they collect some latex from the rubber plants there, they put it in a canoe, they sail up river, they get to an outpost of the rubber plantation, and they sell this product, but 
by they, I mean Inomosho, but he has to dress up in disguise as his old self, Manuel Corrovarios. He puts on white man clothes that are ill-feeding because the chief got them many years ago from a white man. And then he has to speak in his old Spanish accent, the one that he was born with, and he has to go in disguise as this mixed race white man uh, to go and talk to the person who's collecting the latex. And he manages to skirt by all of the inquisitive questions about where he's coming from and why he's ended up with all this latex by himself and makes a bunch of cash and more than enough to do what he's supposed to do. So he puts some of it in credit and uses the rest to buy all of these weapons for the people of the jungle. And they think of them more like, um, like iron blow guns, which emit thunder when they're fired. They don't really understand this concept, but Ino Mosho is able to teach them how to use these things and basically save the tribe from almost certain destruction because now finally the, the score is evened. But that's not the end of the story because some guns is not enough, so they go back. They've got more rubber. They end up at this place again and it works out. They buy more guns and they end up using this trick again, but each time they do, the value of the rubber is less. So Inomosho eventually is not able to buy quite as many guns. He goes back to the tribe and says, I gotta go back, hang out for a second, and finds a ship. Good, all right, thanks guys. Um, he finds a ship that's heading to Manau and steals himself away from the tribe. Um, it's, it's a little bit complicated, but it's nice to hear from his point of view that the reason that he decided he needed to go back to Iquitos is that his early family ties were really strong. So for that reason alone, he probably never completely gave up on the idea of escape and return to his family. He went back to the same house where his father was living and found him there, ready to welcome his child back seven years later as a grown man. And when asked about this experience, he was... He's actually pretty chill about it. He said if conditions had been different, he might have stayed on in the forest for a long time. And in the town of Iquitos, he finds that getting used to a life that has all the comforts of an urban environment is in some ways easy, but in other ways is, is really challenging because he's not the same man as he was when he left. He's got this training that Chief Shimu had given him and also this role, this really empowered and respectful role that he was given that he left behind. But also all of this wisdom from the jungle that didn't leave his mind when he left the tribe. And so he ends up tr practicing medicine in his spare time in Iquitos and helping people to heal from, uh, from diseases that the Western medicinal community thought were, were not treatable. Things like diabetes and lameness and ulcers, kidney stones, asthma, alcoholism, epilepsy, anxiety, depression, cancer. Maybe some of you guys who are familiar with ayahuasca have heard that it's been used in many ways medicinally and um, Manuel Cordova Rios, because he's gone back to playing that role in society, has decided to share these, these skills, this, this world of wisdom that he's been given to the people who live there in the city, kind of stealing this information, this ability to heal people from the tribe itself. And he starts out healing people that are from the jungle or other mixed race people who are familiar with the powers of the jungle practices, the, the medicinal history that has been going on for generations there. But he ends up basically getting pretty well known for being able to cure things that people thought were incurable. Uh, the, the big C is something that he um, wrote that he cured at least three times in his medicinal practices. And eventually his patients included members of the elite, like generals and admirals, a judge, a surgeon, an ambassador, a former president of Peru. And this um, skill basically 
helps him to become known. And in his days of living and working in Iquitos in Peru, people come from all over the region and eventually all over the world to, to find out more about this, this shaman who is using an ancient wisdom and hasn't let go of those ideas. So those scientists think of this this field of science is something that you can distill and study in a lab. He still sings these Icarosi songs to enhance the powers of these jungle plants and can't divorce them from the wisdom that he learned from these shamans. And he believes that the goddess of death of ayahuasca can help him to find diagnoses that he couldn't find by himself. And so he's pretty much able to skirt and and exist in these two worlds at the same time as kind of a magician and kind of a, an expert scientist in the same breath and not willing to divorce one from the other. And the reason I know anything about this is because I went to Peru and I expressed some curiosity and interest as I'm sure all of you in this room would to the man who I was staying with, who I like to call Marquitos. And Marquitos was like, I want you to know about this story and took me to the one bookstore in Lima that has books in English and bought me a copy of this book and handed it to me. And it's fascinating to me how the experience of reading a story from the, the native point of view is so much more complex and interesting than the one that's handed to us from the conquerors. And it's challenging when you're dealing with a culture that speaks a different language than you do, because my Spanish isn't great. And when I go online to look about history of Inomosho or his more um, well-known name of Manuel Cordova Rios, I end up with a, a Wikipedia article. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trash talk Wikipedia, just like Daya here, um, <laughs> that is written from the point of view of somebody who's read the book that the white man wrote. Um, because Bruce Lamb was an American, a forester who went to the jungle and met Manuel Corovo Rios and was very respectful of his story. But you get a very different point of view if you read the book by the Spanish poet who, who has a lot of sympathy, just like Chief Shimu was looking for in the local plight. And it's... I don't know, I hope you agree, a lot more fun than this version of the story. I mean, I'd be up here for a minute and a half if we were left with the white man's history of what happened here. And I feel like that, to me, is really inspiring, that this doesn't have to stop here, because most of our history is written by the rubber barons and the robber barons and the white guys who came and conquered the world, essentially. And this is one example, but an amazing example that I've been trying to tell on this odd salon stage for at least a year about um, a really amazing story that you wouldn't get if, if these people hadn't gone to the jungle to ask this man who'd lived this incredible life but had a lot of respect for this tribe and this culture and this way of life and was willing to share that with these journalists who had the power to get it published. And though this is my favorite, story, there are a lot more out there of people who've gone out and have sought out the, the local point of view. So this is my challenge. Uh, I got on the phone and I called the good folks at Green Apple Books and asked them, here's one example, but I know there's lots more. Can you help me out? And they sent me a whole list of many, many books that I can only uh, challenge you to read. So this week, we're going to put them up on something weird, that Facebook group that you should definitely be on. And I'm going to triple dog dare you right now to go find one. <laughs> Just one. It's a good place to start. Take your pick. Many, many places that are worth learning about. Uh, but we don't have to be satisfied by the white man's point of view. We can totally take this upon ourselves. So I'm going to raise the toast to all those folks who put them words in this world and to all of us who consume them. Cheers.